Hey, what's going on? Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 717, that's Siete Uno Siete, and I hope you are doing well. Wherever this podcast may find you, I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? You know, all good, all things considered. I cannot complain. I really cannot. I'm just sat here adjusting my glasses and making sure my watch isn't burning my wrist. But apart from that, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling fine. I'm eating well. I'm drinking well. I'm working out a bunch. I recently did a little bit of a trim on my beard. So I got that looking nice and straight. And when you do lose a bit of weight, sometimes your jawlines tends to stick out a little bit. So I'm feeling a little bit more confident to take away some of that fluff because that beard can be a good little face shield to protect you or protect people from seeing some of the bad angles you may have but now that that face fat is flipping going off on my face i'm starting to look snatch again i'm starting to have that kate moss angular cheekbones protruding out of my face like absolute like um like little stones right like little hard edge stones on the side of a reef that's how my face is going to be looking angular right people are gonna be like right did you get fillers i'd be like nah bro this is just the cheekbones underneath just protruding out now that I've finally stopped, you know, stuffing my face full of croissants. So that's been good. But yeah, apart from that, I hope you've been good. Hope you've been fine. Um, it's been an interesting couple of days for me, to be honest, or any United fan. All of the, you know, debate and controversy around Sheikh Jassim, unfortunately, from the Qatari group, walking away and withdrawing from the process because it was so protracted and it probably seemed like, or you, or you probably got the feeling most likely the Glazers didn't want to go for his offer, even though it was 100% cash offer. He was going to wipe the debt. He was going to give the most money for the shares that are available right now. It always seemed as if the Glazers didn't really want to sell the club in full. They wanted just to have some bit of investment and obviously still control the majority of it. So they've done that with this bidder now, Sir Jim Ratcliffe. And the story around it, when this originally came out, was that the deal would be ratified by Thursday. So for some reason, the story leaks over the weekend that Sheikh Jassim is withdrawing from the process. Then Sir Jim Ratcliffe is the front runner, um, you know, a couple of days later. And then they tell us all these amazing things that he's going to do, take over the sporting side, implement this, implement that. Um, then there's a weird story that gets floated about Sir Jim Ratcliffe never being a fan of United signing Casemiro, like just some nonsense to kind of appease the fans and put a bit of good pu- good positive PR spin on his um, bid obviously because most people wanted a full sale and the fact that he's coming in with partial ownership is a super 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 underwhelming and then later on in the week we get um, you know some news coming out that they're going to ratify the deal this coming Thursday and that he'll be able to implement some of the changes so he'll be able to start working for the club by the end of the week and now all out of the blue we got confirmation from a few sources that There is no deal being ratified by the end of the week. That's not happening. Um, It's going to get done sometime soon. So it is quite amazing to see the lengths at which the Glazers will go to to just refuse to relinquish any semblance of control in the club. They just don't want to do it. They just refuse to do it. It's just not something that they want to do. They're going to they're going to they're going to draw this out as long as they can. And then when they're good and ready, that's when whoever's going to take over, whether it's partial ownership or full ownership, will get a chance to do so. But until they decide, nothing's moving. So this is courtesy of Sky Sports News. It says, May United wait for Sergeant Radcliffe deal goes on, but the end game in sight ahead of Thursday's board meeting. So there's a board meeting on Thursday where it's meant to be ratified, but there is no indication that it will be ratified on that board meeting. So it's just all up in the air. Who knows what's flipping happening? Um, let's read the actual article here, courtesy of Sky Sports News. Let's scroll down here. It says, uh, Radcliffe expected to purchase 25% of the club um, for $1.3 billion in the deal that would give his company Enios control over the main United's footballing operations. I still have a big um, press X to doubt feeling about this because the Glazers, you know, almost vice-like grip on everything concerning United, on their reluctance to implement any positive changes structurally to the club that would allow us to be more successful on the pitch. Look how long it took for them to appoint a DOF, Director of Football, and even John Murto isn't really a director of football. He was somebody that was working internally at the club who just got promoted to that role. They refused to hire somebody externally who could do it. They brought in Ralph Ragnick, who was a bit too honest and blunt for their liking. And then they, you know, sacked him the moment he basically spoke out of turn. They don't really like a lot of outsiders coming into the club and trying to modernize things or, you know, put in, implement better processes to make us more successful on the, on the pitch. They like the way the club is run, the way it is, however haphazard it is. And I just don't think, even with 25%, 
And then again, who knows if the 25% he's getting is 25% like voting rights, is it 25% of just shares on a particular stock exchange? We're not really too sure. But if I'm judging Ratcliffe, I'm going to be putting this stuff in writing to make sure what I can actually do with the 25%, because I've got a feeling he's approaching this with good faith, probably thinking that they're going to, you know, um, honor the agreement. But most likely, I'm anticipating as soon as he does, you know, ratify the deal and it gets rubber stamped, I'm anticipating somewhere along the line, you'll start hearing stories about Sir Jim Ratcliffe complaining about how hard it is to work with the Glazers about how difficult it is to get anything done. I'm sure that's going to happen. You'll start hearing leaks approaching it because the Glazers aren't like normal owners, you know? They don't... It's like normal owners who just want to take money out of the club. As long as you're making them money, they don't care what you do with the football side of things. The Glazers kind of want to take money out of the club. They also don't want to invest in the club and they also want to have control over all the footballing side decision-making process. It's really odd. The, the, the almost control freak aspect of them. Um, it continues here. It says it's a very complicated deal, but I think that this is why it's taken a little bit longer than anticipated. That's bullshit. It's been going on for a year now, right? A year plus it's approaching. Uh, it's not that complicated, to be honest. They, they've known their way into have investors or solar car for a long time. They're just stretching it out because they don't really want to sell. They want investment, but they want it on their terms. It continues here. Um, we're approaching the end game, and I think that is going to be Sergeant Ratcliffe buying the least major minority stake to begin with. Um, another oh and then I think the, the basically the assumption is here um, in the article basically what they're saying that paragraph I just read there's a story going around that allegedly so Jim Ratcliffe went to buy the whole amount hasn't had didn't have the money to, to buy it so now as a way to get his foot in the door he's going to purchase the 25 percent and then eventually over the years purchase the other remaining bits and then get a controlling stake in the club eventually taking over I don't think that's possible. I personally think the Glazers never wanted to sell the club in full. I think they wanted to float, um, the you know, they wanted to they wanted to get gauge the interest on the market, which obviously I'm sure is somewhat illegal, especially if you do it, if you, especially if your club is publicly listed, to just float it and then withdraw the you know the opportunity for someone to buy it in full is a bit odd. I would imagine so. There is maybe some legality issues there, but I think they always wanted to float the idea of selling the club, um, not sell it, but wanted to get a lot of money for a small stake of quote-unquote investment and then over the years what they could do is that they could kind of double triple quadruple dip and keep selling the same amount or maybe less of the club for more than previous years because what we have to consider is let's imagine in a scenario which is very unlikely but let's imagine a scenario where Sergeant Ratcliffe actually does a good job he comes in implements some good changes with that 25 percent controlling stake he has in the club the club then becomes successful. We win a Champions League. We win a Premier League. Blah, blah, blah. The next time somebody tries to purchase a 25% of the club, it's going to be worth far more than what Sir Jim Ratcliffe paid when he came in and the club was where it's at now at the moment. So I have a feeling the Glazers want to do that. They just want to keep, you know, selling little bits as the club keeps improving. And then eventually they'll probably get to that magic 10 billion mark. That's what some people on the inside and all the ITKs and shit and people with their ear to the ground are saying that the Glazers' actual number that they're not really, you know, saying aloud, but if someone brings that number to them, they're going to sell, is 10 billion. I think Sheikh Jassim offered, I think, like five to six or something, which is still above the uh, market valuation of the club. I think the valuation of the club is like 3 billion, but Sheikh Jassim offered five to six, but the Glazers actually want 10 billion. But they could probably get 10 billion if they sell bits of the club a longer, like a 10 year process, a period, sorry. And if the club is successful along that 10 year period, every piece they sell will be more expensive than the previous piece. So, you know, it's a bit shit for us fans. No, it's not a bit shit. It's the worst thing ever, to be honest, because in the process, it could also go wrong and it could bleed our club dry and cripple us and put us in the worst position that we're in at the moment. And then by the time someone takes over, it's going to take even more money than it would do now to kind of get us back to the level of competing. But hey, what do I know? Continue with the article. Another indication that Ratcliffe deal for United is getting closer is a report from Bloomberg which claims Ineos will hold a credit update call on Monday the f on Monday at 3pm to update the shareholders. The, the petrochemicals company is not commenting. Okay, cool. 
First day's Man United board beating um, is a standard practice, has not been called for specific reasons to discuss the deal. They are usually partial, um, but no, they're usually partly virtual because the Glazer family are based in the States. It's also unlikely that there'll be a resolution for the strategic review, which sparked a long um, winded takeover race involving Ratcliffe and Sheikh Jassim. Sorry, um, after it was announced last November. The Qatari bid led by Sheikh Jassim withdrew from the process last weekend, eight months after initially declaring its plans to buy the club. It is fought and was only an offer for 100% of the club. So, so there's some people out there that are alleging, and as you see there's a timeline here, courtesy of Sky Sports News, the actual, the actual process started in November 22nd, 2022. So it's fast approaching a year now basically and still the club hasn't been sold so you can see how much of a nonsense it all was but there are some people out there that are still holding out hope um who and basically saying that the way the news was leaked over the weekend made it seem odd so most likely maybe some people are suggesting that maybe Sergeant Jim Ratcliffe has people in the press or in the media that purposely put the news out there that he was close to sealing the deal over the weekend because they knew not a lot of journalists could be around to correct that news until the Monday and then by then that might put pressure on the Glazers and that Sheikh Jassim is still involved in the race who knows but this is kind of the sentiment that is existing a lot of fans out there are just desperate for a change and they're desperate to cling on to any type of hope so one of them is this quote um, taken from MUFC, MUFC MPB account that says some key figures inside the deal also remain sceptical that Sheikh Jassim bin Hamid Al-Tahini has entirely withdrawn his interest in the club. Sources close to Qatari, however, have reaffirmed their instances, their insistence, sorry, that he told the Glazers last week he'd quit the process. So some people are saying Sheikh Jassim is still in the race. Um, he's just pulled away as a as a as a negotiation tactic to kind of put pressure on the Glazers because he's walking away with the whole entire cash deal that he was putting on the table. And some people are suggesting no, he's told them last week, like I gave you a deadline, you didn't agree to it, now I'm walking away. Which I think makes more sense, especially when you marry up with the story that has come out in the last two days about the Glazers allegedly feeling um very offended or feeling attacked or something or judged because of Sheikh Jassim's earlier comment when he first tried to buy the club of trying to restore United to its former glories. Um, the Glazers allegedly didn't like that statement that came out from Sheikh Jassim. And essentially, if I remember correctly at the time, they even brought out, put out a statement that said all bidders should refrain from commenting on the current ownership or something. So it's basically them telling off Sheikh Jassim and telling him to shut his fucking mouth. So... As dumb as that is, and as petty as that is, I would assume, uh, you know, family like the Glazers who've gone out of their way to absolutely destroy this great club of mine, they would most likely really would feel offended that somebody is kind of, you know, openly judging their tenure and kind of basically calling into it, calling it, calling it into question and saying that it was a horrible ownership and then saying that they're going to do a far better job. It wouldn't surprise me if they said, "Hey, you know what? We don't like this, so we're going to not but give you the club now out of spite." It wouldn't surprise me. And then, you know, obviously, Sergeant Rackoff is a perfect person to kind of go for because he's willing to be malleable. He's willing to bend to whatever demand the Glazers have just so he can be the person that can say, I own me United. Because you'd imagine a lot of these guys, especially people at this sort of level, you know, you've got all the money in the world. You bought all the things that you need. You're advancing in age. The only thing left really is your legacy. So if you can be a childhood quote-unquote Man United fan and say that you own a part of the club or that you're a co-owner of the club it's going to be something that will you know make you rest easy when you're finally your time finally does come so it wouldn't surprise me that the Glazers would prefer to go with Jim Ratcliffe because he's more malleable um, and obviously in kind of contrast to um, Sheikh Jassim um, he's also going to only he's, go, he's going to be just happy with the partial ownership because of his legacy and what that's going to mean for the future of his family and whatnot so let's see what happens um i'm not look feeling optimistic i've all but given up on the qatari group thing even though that was the one chance we had to really restore united back to its former glories most likely sheikh jassim sorry um surgeon ratcliffe is going to be the one who's going to win this bid and win this race it makes a lot more sense because i felt like the glazers never wanted to sell the club in full anyway so why why not sell the club to a guy um, so why not sell 25% sorry, to a guy who you know wants that control for a lot of money and then you can still basically run the club how you want but then have this guy feel like he's a glorified employee essentially so let's see what happens let's see what runs through but I'm not feeling optimistic in the slightest I'm not feeling optimistic in the slightest moving on to some really crazy news this is courtesy of billboard man this is 
one of the most wildest stories I've been kind of keeping an eye on for a while. I've been um, posting a lot about this stuff on my other live stream that I do on YouTube called um, The Random Show. So if you know my channel, it's called T-A-Z-S. So it's Taz on YouTube or just type in the Agassino Zinger Show, you'll find it and click on the live tab and you'll see um, the show that I do sometimes, you know, maybe three or four times a week where I just talk about comedy stuff and other random shit, obviously the clues in the name. And I've been covering a lot of this um, house flipping scam, Ponzi scheme thing going on with DJ Envy and this guy called Cesar Pena. So if you're not familiar, DJ Envy is one half or one third of the famous legendary um, radio show called The Breakfast Club. And he suddenly started to get into the whole property developing, um, you know, business that people were doing a couple of years ago. And that kind of started kicking off and then it kind of ramped up during the pandemic, I guess, because people saw that they were in a tough situation. They needed the ability to make some, you know, some money to allow themselves to clock out of the grind, to allow them to have some residual income, to get themselves out of poverty, wherever it may be. It really did kind of go into overdrive around the pandemic time, maybe because of the stimulus checks as well. Who knows? Either way, that business went crazy. Crazy. Um, DJ Envy ends up meeting this guy called Caesar, who's already doing the house flipping thing, and then they kind of co collaborate and join forces where they hold these seminars where they basically teach people how to make money, and then they also have this part of their business where they buy properties in like the you know uh, dilapidated areas in America or dilapidated homes themselves. They redo them up, and then they sell them for a profit or they rent them out or something and the idea behind it was that you would all pull your money in together and invest on a property so they would buy a property in somewhere in new jersey for like two hundred thousand dollars and then you'd put your you know you would put your money in to kind of help to renovate the and shit and then what they would do is that they would say they can guarantee returns which should have been the biggest red flag for people they were guaranteeing i think like 30 percent return so if you was to give um dj envy and caesar pena 100,000 of your money to invest in a property somewhere in new jersey they were guaranteeing you one hundred and thirty thousand dollars back from your one hundred thousand, so you could get thirty on top of it in six months. Which, in most cases, from what I've read online, is crazy. I think the market average people are saying, or industry average, is around like you know, was it some say that two to nine percent in terms of guaranteed um, you know outcomes and stuff. But even then, there is no such thing as a guarantee with those type of investments. So it then gets revealed that that whole entire thing was a scam. It wasn't a scam like they started it and then they kind of got greedy. No, from the minute one, there was no houses. All the houses they were taking people on site visits to, they didn't own. They didn't have their their name on the paperwork, like nothing, zero. So all that money was just going straight to their pockets or other, or paying off other investors, you know, basically in the Ponzi scheme type thing. And obviously a lot of people online, content creators, one of them being Tony the Closer, has been talking about this topic and, you know, breaking it down and basically being like the black coffeezilla of this entire thing and really blowing it up and exposing people and warning people. And basically he's been the kind of go-to person to sort of like catch up on the news around it. And the really distressing part about it is that last time of checking, the total amount now that people are speculating has been scammed by DJ MV and Cesar Pena they're alleging it's upwards of like 100 million now the last time i checked i think they said 80 but now they're saying 100 million dollars is probably the final figure of how much money these guys were scamming from their fans um who went into joining on this business so it's pretty pretty crazy how far this whole thing has gone so long story less long now the recent development curse your billboard is the most really um crazy part of it because it's looking like all the fucking cards are falling down Curse your billboard that says Health Flipper tied to DJ Envy charged with Ponzi like real estate fraud scheme by feds. So Caesar Pena, the other guy involved in the Ponzi scheme, has finally been arrested by the feds. Absolutely wild. So it says here, Caesar Pena, a celebrity house flipper with close ties to New York City, um, her radio host DJ Envy, was arrested on Wednesday on federal charges that he perpetrated a multi million dollar Ponzi like investment fraud scheme. The charges came after months of social media accusations and civil litigations against Pena, whose victims stole, whose victims say he stole their money with promises of big returns. DJ MV, real name Rayshon Casey, has been caught up in a scheme because critics say he helped promote Pena, including his appearances on the nationally syndicated hip hop show The Breakfast Club Edition is doing nice. Yeah, that's a big part of the story that I forgot to mention. So one of the other reasons why DJ MV is like intrinsically tied to this whole case is that he promoted Caesar Penny on the Breakfast Club. Like he brought him on there numerous times to essentially 
you know um, acquire new leads and promote their business and talk about how they approach business and blah 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 their partnership their work relationship all this sort of nonsense so um he is intrinsically tied to it and a lot of people who they've been interviewing or the victims who have kind of had their money stolen are essentially be saying that they would have never heard of Cesar Pena if he didn't appear on a radio show and some of them are going as far as saying that how the radio they trust so if that guy is on the radio talking about a business why wouldn't they think it's legit which is a lot of reasons you know obviously you should have your own um levels of critical thinking but i do understand that line of thinking if it's on the radio if it's on tv why wouldn't i think it's a scam why would i think it's a scam sorry um the article continues in announcing the charges federal authorities said pina had exploited celebrity status and social media to develop um a devout following of potential victims Promising returns that were too good to be true, Pena allegedly defrauded dozens of people of millions of dollars, said New Jersey U.S. Attorney Philip Selinger, said in a statement. Our office is committed to protecting the public from these schemes and prosecuting those who lie to investors for their own personal gain. DGMV is not naming the charges and is not accused of any criminal wrongdoing, but federal prosecutors specifically noted that Pena partnered with a celebrity disc jockey and radio personality listed in charges individual one to boost his reputation as a real estate guru. So people are really debating on whether or not DJ Envy will get prosecuted. I don't think that will happen, but most likely because of all the stink around it and because of him working for iHeartMedia and on a big platform like The Breakfast Club, most likely he'll end up getting suspended and in the end you'll probably end up getting fired because those companies don't like to be embroiled in these sort of scandals for free. They'd rather not. They'd rather just cut ties. Even if you're innocent, they'd just rather cut ties. You figure it out. If you're innocent, you come back. If not, okay, sayonara. But they don't want to deal with this nonsense. So he's going to really suffer off that because I always felt like, you know, the Breakfast Club had a big role in making DJ Envy as successful as he is now. So when he loses that paycheck, loses that opportunity, um, loses that platform, it takes away a lot of the things that have been making him money over the years. And now that he's been burnt in business with this whole flipping houses scam, it makes it very tricky to see where is the way out for him. So it's going to get really real, really quickly for DJ Envy, unfortunately. Um, even if he doesn't end up in jail, he's still going to have to, you know, he's still going to have a lot of squeaky bum times coming up. It continues here. It says, together they use individual celebrities to promote various real estate enterprises, sorry, that Pena controlled. Pena represented, um, represented that he was a highly successful real estate investor owned founders of properties in multiple states and had business relationships with numerous celebrities attorneys for both pina and envy did not return court requests for comment the accusations against pina first cropped up in may when an instagram account accused him of defrauding numerous investors and accused envy of playing a key role that led to a flood of civil suits from dozens of victims who say pina owed them thousands if not millions of dollars one victim's attorney estimated that more than 30 investors had already come forward Forward, seeking over 40 million from Pena and his wife Jennifer. Many of those lawsuits, including one filed by music industry veteran Anthony Martini, named DJ Envy as a co confid as a co-defendant, citing their roles, um, their close ties, sorry, including Pena's frequent appearance on the Breakfast Club and a series of real estate um seminars that the two men co-hosted. One case um says Envy aided in the better the fraudsters by using public likenesses as well as one of radio disc jockey to promote their real estate scheme. That for me is the one that just I can't still get my head around because as much as I hate scams, as much as I hate frauds, it's very prevalent in the industry. Everyone kind of does it. So there's probably an acceptance within some of these celebrities conscious wise where they're like, this is so obviously a scam. If you get duped by it, you probably sort of deserve it. And it's such a soft touch one. Maybe that's what they think. I still think it's deplorable, but maybe that's what they think and the reason why i say that is because you see a lot of celebrities especially women doing those doing that scam where you win like a prize where they stand in front of loads of cars and they have loads of bags from designer brands like louis vuitton and gucci lying on the floor and it's some sort of like um i think it's like a sweepstake lottery thing i forgot what it was but everyone's done it i've seen pictures of Nicki minaj kim kardashian all these people doing these sort of scams those things are like they kind of feel like these one, they sort of feel like a scam, but also a little bit of like a marketing social media type of thing, paid advertising, where whoever's in charge of doing those things, allegedly from what I read online, they pay upwards of like $1 million for those posts. So you get your $1 million, you post in front of these shopping bags as a celebrity, and then once the period is over of the deal, you just delete the post and keep it moving, right? That's one thing. But basically trying to pretend like that scheme is legit 
and then bringing it on your own platform on a daily, taking on other legit platforms. That's where it gets a bit dicey. And for Envy, it's one thing he may be scamming people on the side, outside of fucking the Breakfast Club, but bringing his scamming co-conspirator onto his, to his workplace, sorry, and then blasting that scamming message to a potential audience of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, that's where I just cannot understand the sense in that man. Like I said, I hate scammers, but surely doing in your own time is far better than bringing a scammer to your place of work and then fucking up that situation. Because maybe there's a there's a possibility or there's a scenario if Envy did the scamming with Cesar Pena on the side without the involvement or without the association of Breakfast Club and made it very clear this is a separate thing. Because even when he was introducing himself on the video clips with Cesar Pena talking about you know basically giving rah-rah speeches about motivation and business and stuff he'd always start off with that corny this is DJ Envy he'd do that same fucking little thing he does for the Breakfast Club so there was no real separation between DJ Envy the Breakfast Club DJ and DJ Envy um doing the flipping houses thing it's the same person so maybe there's a scenario where DJ Envy could have separated himself from the whole situation by making it very clear that hey this flipping houses thing has nothing to do with my regular nine to five and i want to make that clear this is not financial advice blah blah blah, blah duh, 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 duh. maybe he could have gotten away that way but the flagrancy of just bringing that guy to your place of work and acting as if it was all legit that's when it's a bit mad you know what i mean um it continues here it says envy says those kinds of allegations are not only false and he says himself he's also a victim of c's opinions alleged scheme but is also defamatory um he's soon a social media influencer who publicized the allegations in an interview with billboard last week envy's lawyer um said that the client had nothing to do with the specific deals involved opinions alleged scheme and was being targeted by lawyers and critics who were sensationalizing the case by involving a celebrity envy has no involvement whatsoever the only reason he is being dragged through this is because he's a public figure well public figure or not he's going to be in big trouble like i said maybe he won't end up in jail maybe most likely he'll get a situation where he'll have to like plead out or something which will also be super interesting to see like how far will he go to save his own ass will he legitimately throw um caesar pena under under the bus and quote unquote snitch super hard and try and pretend like he didn't know what was going on or will he take his time, take the punishment like a man and dust himself up and keep it moving? Either way, it's going to be squeaky bum time for him because we know him to have very expensive taste. We know him to live a very lavish lifestyle. Um, we know him to be the kind of person that, you know, there's no expense spared. So you'd imagine once you lose your regular nine to five at the breakfast club, which allegedly, according to my Googles, um, pays him anywhere between $900,000 to $3 million a year, that's a big chunk of money that you make um, that you're not going to be able to make anymore, especially if you're suspended without pay or you're just straight up fired. And I would imagine the Breakfast Club opportunity or the platform itself probably gives him more opportunities outside of the Breakfast Club. It comes with its own cachet, maybe walkthroughs, maybe DJ gigs, hosting gigs, whatever there is. I'm sure that job has afforded him many other business opportunities and ventures. So that all goes away once that main job goes away so um he has a lot on the line um so don't be surprised if he does get desperate and he does completely throw Caesar Penny under the bus and maybe even his wife and then we get a situation where he gets away with it kind, kind of scot-free and Caesar's the one that takes the bare brunt of it but I'm still not sold on the idea that DJ Envy is the mastermind I don't think he's you know without being offensive he's not smart enough to be the mastermind of a, a scam like this especially to this kind of level I just think he's probably one of those type of people who he probably had a feeling something was dodgy, but because he was benefit because he was monetarily benefiting from it, he didn't want to say anything. And now it's going south. He's suddenly trying to be the victim. But that's what I think happened. I think he did have an idea that Caesar was scamming, but because he was getting paid his money, um, there was no need. He felt incentive for him to call it out or to you know um to make it aware to people and stuff so it's still going to be sketchy for him let's see how it plays out but yeah man keep safe out there mind your money don't be investing it in just weirdos because you see them on social media although it does to me represent how toxic fucking celebrity culture can be because a lot of these people only like they said invested in that caesar Pena guy because they saw him appear on a breakfast club it just goes to show that if you're a celebrity and you get a bit of clout around you you can basically get away with murder because for some people they just think because you're famous for doing something that you're far more trustworthy in the field that they don't know you for. It's really, really odd. But hey, what do I know? 
Moving on, we've got this news courtesy of RA from a couple of weeks ago, but I thought I'd report on it now because it still makes me kind of chuckle because it reminds me of another instance that I kind of went through in Berghain. But this is courtesy of RA. It says, Berlin's Kit Kat Club is slammed by alleged victims of sexual assault and harassment. Several people spoke with RA. This is probably the most least surprising news ever that one of the most sordid, um, you know, nightclubs over there in Berlin, because it's more of a sex king club, essentially, that for the most part, from what I've read online, also doesn't have the strictest door policy, would have an issue with um, sexual assault and harassment. It's not surprising in the slightest, but it also does make me laugh because, you know, the Berliners love to like wax poetic and lyrical just about how safe their scene is and about how much better than than everybody else. But they seem to have the same issues when it comes to nightlife that most, you know, I would say like horrible cities are to club have like london right no no a lot of, not a lot of berliners would swap london nightlife um for theirs but we have the same issues right even though our one is probably a little bit more commercialized it's probably for a lot more normies it's probably a lot more chad straight bro kind of energy that these guys don't like the clubs close early blah 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 but we still have the same levels of issues so it probably just goes to speak to just how difficult it is in nightlife overall no matter how long your clubs are open, it's just difficult to have anything near um, equivalent to a safe space. It just doesn't, it's not possible. It's just the nature of going out at night, the nature of going to nightclubs, it's always going to invite, um, you know, questionable, sketchy people, unfortunately. Um, it just kind of is the way it is. And I think you just have to maybe implement processes and, you know, maybe whatever procedures to sort of alleviate those issues. But I don't think you can ever read them, to be completely honest. But hey, Let's read the article. So, it says, Berlin's sex-positive club, Kit Kat, has been slammed by attendees who say it's been a breeding ground for sexual predators. A breeding ground for sexual predators is fucking wild, bro. I've never... This is one thing that I've kind of... Happy I never really kind of got into, to be honest, the whole sex club thing in techno. It's just never something that just, I, I've drawn to. I don't not like it. You know, it's not something that I kind of openly go out of my way to insult or anything. It's just, just not my vibe. Um, I've never really understood the point of it, to be completely honest. Like, you know, if I want my sex, I will separate it from my music. It's not something that I kind of want to have mixed into one. But hey, what do I know? It continues. It says, several people wrote to Resident Advisor after the Mita venue came out of fire this summer for hosting Ramstein frontman Till Lindemann, who was uh, at the time facing charge of sexual assault. Promoter Mays was among the people who got in touch with RA. Now based in London, they said that they were at Kit Kat in October in 2021 for a party called Symbiotica. Um, they were there with their then girlfriend on a dance floor when a naked older man just grabbed my hips really hard and began pressing behind me. It was pretty gross. I wanted to get away from that situation. <laughs> I could just imagine, bro, how many of those type of dudes exist in places like Kit Kat on just a weekly, on a nightly basis, probably. It continues. May said that they later saw the same guy harassing femme presenting vulnerable people at the party. He would just come up and rub his dick on whatever anyone was wearing. Wow. They added that they said that there were no safeguarding staff members in sight to help the after the traumatizing scenario. That that's the thing about sex clubs. Like I think people have this in their mind, especially the creepos, that it's some sort of big nightclub orgy thing. But it's not really that, is it? It's mostly a regular nightclub under the premise or with the theme of it being a little bit more sexually active than the regular club. But it's not as if like everybody on the dance floor wants to fuck. Some people just want to be in that ambiance. They just want to be around that kind of energy. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they want their, your genitals rubbed up against their bum or their thigh. Especially your flaccid genitals. That's absolutely disgusting, bro. God damn. So this is the sort of place um, that really um, shit for everyone. No, there's a quote saying. Sorry, the quote is saying is this. This is a quote, right? Yeah. So this is the sort of place that's really shit for everyone who's vulnerable and being harassed or insulted, Mace continued. I came away thinking that these people in charge really don't give a fuck about what's going on inside. It's a bit of a pit for predators to approach the vulnerable. I'm actually surprised. You know what? I'm not kind of surprised because you don't really hear people. This is an odd thing to say, but... It was. It always surprised me the lack of people that you know talk about getting turned away from Kit Kat. You know the big you know trend with Berghain is people talking about how to get in, complaining when they don't get in, um, posting you know testimonies about how amazing it was when they got in and understand and now they understand what door picking is about. Blah blah blah. 
you don't really hear the same amount of speech around that sort of stuff when it comes to Kit Kat. I even see more people online complaining they didn't get in at fucking Sissy Foss than they do at Kit Kat. So Kit Kat looks like the type of place where if you legitimately turn up there wearing some Amazon basic harnesses and chokers and all this sort of PVC nonsense to make you look like you understand where you're about to be and what it's about and you just go in there, uh, you know, with a jock strap on or something like that and nothing else in a pair of boots, people just let you in because you somehow fit the look but there's no other investigation or digging in deep or whatever it may be or vibe checking apart from that it seems like if you just put the uniform on you're in so it's not surprising that it's a bit of a breeding ground for this type of level of harassment and shit it does make a lot of sense to be fair it continues Mays did didn't submit any official complaint to the venue because they said that they had little faith it would be dealt with properly Pretty much everyone I've spoken to who isn't a cis straight man finds Kit Kat very unnerving, very creepy. I decided I wouldn't ever go back. I love the fucking little, I love how cisgendered straight men like myself just keep getting this regular little, you know, just a little like a little bullet there. Just we have nothing to do with this. Oh, no, we do, actually, because the guy that did it is probably says, OK, I see. I take that back. But it's just hilarious how for some reason. I guess there is probably a thinking within dance music that cis straight men are the ones who ruin clubs, are the ones who ruin parties, are the ones who pollute dance floors. And I would say, and I would push back and say, I don't think so. I think we all play a part in ruining it because I don't think things are meant to last forever. The good thing is I think they're meant to have a run. You're meant to enjoy them for what they are. But inevitably, the more popular a party, a club, a scene becomes, it's always going to attract some, you know, um, some, uh, some characters that you probably wouldn't want to spend your free time with. That's not a slight on the cisgendered nature of people. It's just a nature of the party and the scene, especially because Kit Kat is a world renowned club, right? I think most people around the world who are into the kind of music that I'm into or the kind of music they play over there will probably know of Kit Kat. So that is just, you know, it's part of the, it's part of the process of growing to that kind of scale, which again, makes me think people should put a little bit more respect on places like Berghain and their ability to, um, for the most part avoid big scandals like this yes there are still issues there i understand but for the scale of the club they do a really good job by you know making sure that they're holding onto the reins and it doesn't get too crazy it continues it says launching 994 kick is renowned for helping conceive berlin's sex positive movement the dress code is defined as fetish latex leather uniform kinky glitter and glamorous attire but according to may the club fails to visibly define its rules for consent which sets it apart from other sex positive spaces that clearly signpost the nature of the event and it's the code of conduct ra asked kick cut club about its consent and signposting policy but received no repost exactly and that's a weird thing as well i've noticed a lot of these sex positive parties especially in london they're ultra strict like they're not as like i said i think some people have it in their head that sex positive parties are big orgies where there's a dj playing in the background but they go out of their way a lot of the more popular ones here in london to really make it clear on what is allowed and what isn't allowed in terms of how you're meant to talk to people how you're meant to approach people they make it very well known that we have wardens who are wearing particular color vests or wristbands patrolling the space like they go out of their way to make it known that this is a we're trying to make this a safe space if you break the rules you're going to be fucking chucked out and banned forever so it's kind of it's kind of in the back of your mind as you go into these places to kind of be on your best behavior and obviously there's a lot of like self-policing i'd assume as well in that little community of people too especially if you are enjoying the raven it's within your best interest to make sure that there's no creeps there so it doesn't get ruined and doesn't get shut down and shit um but again you know the fact that they put all this stuff out there the kick out in terms of dress code and they make it as like a you know a basically the barrier of entry is you walking in with fetish latex um leather uniform kinky and glamorous and you basically get in um and that basically is maybe the crux of the issue um there isn't anything more to add to it than just that really kind of surface level it continues here it says but according to May, an RA spoke to one other former kick attendee, Dana, who visited the club regularly in 2019 and early 2020. She said that only the signs that she can remember seeing were very basic ones that like consent is important if anyone doesn't interfere against your wishes to just go to the security. She said she doesn't recall any signs about specific rules. So no signs about rules, no security or people patrolling the dance floor, um, punters who probably don't give a fuck. Nice recipe disaster. 
nice recipe for disaster it continues but i know the party goers don't understand um, the concept of consent very well which was one of the main reasons i stopped going there another alleged incident took place during a gegen party in february 2023 it's very recent one artist who wishes to remain anonymous told R and ra that they were groped twice at Kit Kat before a friend intervened the man just wouldn't fucking listen a lot of us were that a lot of us have fun run away with, with the, from a very horrible world sorry a lot of us have fun what let me say that again sorry my english my comprehension of the english language is really suffering here a lot of us have run away from a very horrible world we don't need predators. Our community is already full of emotionally fragile people who should feel safe, not be subjected to something horrible happening to them. Yeah, that's true, but that's also a little bit fanciful. I think, unfortunately, like I keep saying, I'm somebody that operates um, under the proviso that I try to live in the world as is, as opposed to trying to create the world in my image. I'm not that egotistic or arrogant to think the world needs to bend to my every need. But you have to just be on your P's and Q's and know, unfortunately, in nightlife, you're always is going to attract um unpleasant characters i think even bergheim i always mention it all the time but even with their strict door policy i'm pretty sure a few cunts um happen to walk through their doors every single weekend and will do until that club is no longer around it's just the nature of the beast um they have to obviously implement things inside the club processes and maybe attitudes of people feeling personally responsible and stuff to flip in alleviate those issues i feel like personally that's really 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 important more so than saying oh we run away from that world. We don't want it, that toxicity to be inside the club. It's like, bro, that's not really, you know, that doesn't really make any um, logical sense. But hey, what do I know? It continue here. According to anonymous artists, there were awareness team members at Kit Kat when the incident occurred, but not enough of them. So there was actual people that were meant to be there to help you, and they still didn't help you. Jesus. The quote. I couldn't see anyone I could approach and definitely didn't want to report the incident to the bouncers because what's the point? When people try to report something to them, they often get kicked out. <laughs> that is so fucking grim. That is so fucking mean, right? Imagine you're reporting an instance where you're feeling like you're being assaulted, you're being abused, you're being harassed sexually to a bouncer and they just get annoyed that you're quote unquote moaning and they what, kick you out? Come on, man. Um, the kind of violating um, behavior they alleged is part of the quote unquote culture of Kit Kat, not Gagan per se, because they've been to Gagan parties and other Berlin venues and not had any problems. At other venues, people seen breaking the rules of conduct as removed from the venue they added. Okay, cool. So to try to make it clear, it's not Gagan, um, it's Kit Kat. Kit Kat must move with the times, anonymous artists added. Otherwise, it will be continue to attract people who think it's free for all, which is a huge misunderstanding and makes it perfect breeding ground for predators. Many people in Berlin BDSM scene don't like Kit Kat for that reason. I know that's true. I understand that. But there's also needs to be a lot of kind of onus responsibility put on the organizers and people that organize these places and less so on saying, oh, we need to rid of all the monsters because you're never going to do that. My example of that is that fucking crazy Mary Moxtamir story that she shared. Um, with some paper in Germany, I think, where she was talking about she went to some party somewhere and um, where she got booked to play. And for some reason, there was no artist way to get to the stage. So she had to walk to the stage through the crowd. She walks to the stage through the crowd and some random guy in the crowd like grabs her breast. <laughs> and he doesn't get chucked out, I think, or something crazy like that. And then as she's playing, she's seen the guy in the crowd like fucking standing there and shit. Like, just imagine how terrifying that must be to be in that situation so again that could easily be alleviated by the fucking organizers having a way for the artists and djs to fucking get themselves from the vet from the front door of the venue or the gate to the fucking dj without passing through hordes of fucking people who are maybe drunk and high and just too excited that should be possible to do but hey they don't so here we are we continue here it says ra approached gegen for comment on the alleged incident the spokesperson said the party um was that B BIPOC awareness team which was established in 2014 to deal with misconduct wasn't made aware of the alleged incident and such allegations are taken very seriously at Gagan he added awareness team crew members patrol Kit Kat 
and are stationed um, strategically near the toilets, the main floor DJ booth and next to the paramedics teams. Um, details of how to help you and feel violent if you feel violated or uncomfortable can be found on printed materials at the party and online. Gagan's spokesperson also said it's disheartening to learn that alleged victims of sexual assault, possibly influenced by concerns of related reputation of kick out bouncers, was deterred from reaching out for help. He said that while these team is aware of allegations regarding kick out, it's important to note that Gagan parties are separate entities with distinct security and measures in place. Yes, distinct, but I think anybody involved in a sex positive scene in Berlin specifically should probably avoid hosting any parties at kick out until they get their shit in order because the stink around them the dark cloud that hangs around them when it comes to this sort of funny business with abuse and harassment is just too much you're always going to be lumped in with them if you keep throwing parties there. you just have to separate yourself um according to lutz um from the berlin club commission which shares building with kick out the venue hires its own security and bar up but promoters usually hire their own security teams aha all right so it's basically a accepted thing in the berlin scene that the kit kats in-house team are shit they don't they don't give a shit they don't care or they don't enforce the rules body blah 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 so a lot of people that do host events there bring their own team because they want to guarantee people's safety and shit or at least try to he said the club commission's awareness academy which provides violence and assault prevention training for venues and promoters and collectives has previously collaborated with individual workers and promoters at kick out and will extend this collaboration i love that they got this in berlin in it i wonder if we have the similar thing this is how seriously they take fucking nightlife they have a club commission's awareness academy which provides violence and assault prevention training for venues promoters and collectives fucking sick it continues um m an attendee at king parties across europe said um, she went to kick out for the first time in march of this year for symbiotica in the clubs i go to you see visible monitors um wearing armbands walking around the crowd so you know who to go to if something happens i noticed none of this at kick out during her time at the venue m said a random guy came <laughs> it's always guys isn't it like jesus fucking hell bro we are we have a horrible reputation out here on the dance floor um during her time at the venue she said a random guy came and stood right next to her and a friend while they were engaged in an intimate play he came out of nowhere and tried to join us that's never happened to me before fucking hell yeah because there's a lot of rules and etiquette around that sort of stuff i remember when i was reading it when crossbreed was around um about the things that you know you're meant to you're meant to do and not do there's also loads of videos of it as well on youtube i'm sure there's people posting little reels of how to act and conduct yourself at king parties but basically it's common sense isn't it what you don't do is just sit there and stare at people right you don't stand next to people when they're engaged in their in their play or whatever they're doing it's just common sense shit but obviously if you're a creepo those are prime places to go to do your, your creep shit but it also reminds me of this a little bit i remember that time i keep mentioning all the time but that time when I went to fucking R uh, Berghain and I was upstairs in Panorama Bar, I kind of said hello fleetingly to Juliana Hoxable that didn't really go too well because she wasn't, you know, she didn't seem like she liked to um, have conversations, especially with strange men. So that didn't go too well. And then uh, instantly I saw one of the guys that was involved in Crossbreed. His name was Kiwi. And Crossbreed was one of our biggest and most popular sort of like kink parties here in London. And he was, I think, maybe DJing in Berlin at that time. I don't know why he was there, but it doesn't fucking matter. I bump into him, say hi. We have a pleasant little, you know, in-club conversation. And in the time we're having a conversation, a random girl is, like, sloshing all over the place and acting super high, super drunk and shit. But I was concerned because I didn't know what, what was happening because I was like, you know, oh, my God, is she all right? So in an effort to try to make sure she was all right because she was standing around both me and the guy from Crossbreed, I went, oh, you're right, and kind of reached out to like hold her because I think she was about to fall down or something. She was moving around a lot. And then I remember Crossbreed guy scolding me, like giving me a dirty look and scolding me and saying, no touching, and kind of trying to tell me off and essentially insinuating that I was taking advantage of the girl in that situation. Even though that was clearly not the case, that's what he kind of tried to intimate and put out there. And like, obviously in the moment, I was like, what? Like kind of aghast by it. I didn't really pay too much mind. Kept talking to her anyway. Like, oh, are you okay? Blah, 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 blah. And then I think it got to a point where me and another girl that I was talking to at the Panorama Bar, we ended up fucking helping out that girl, giving her a glass of water and shit, and then taking her back to her friends. And then obviously, by the time we took her back to her friends, we realized quite quickly, oh, there's nothing wrong with her. She's just really fucked off GHB because her friend looked exactly the same and the other friends are all there. They had this sort of like a zombie kind of state about them. So it was, it was, it was a bit of a false alarm. 
But I remember just feeling really shitty at the time. Like, how dare this guy try to insinuate that I was trying to sexually uh, take sexual advantage of this woman or something? I don't know. It was such a weird thing to do to somebody. But then when the news came out later on, a few months later, that you know there was issues around maybe bullying and harassment and stuff concerning that Kiwi guy um, at Crossbreed, which is funny too because I think if I'm not mistaken, the allegations against the founder of Crossbreed, one of London's popular kind of kink parties, wasn't that he was abusive on the dance floor, all that sort of nasty stuff. It was stuff like I'm, I'm assuming behind the scenes, like maybe interpersonal issues, talking to people were rude, way, whatever it may be. But I just found it hilarious that that same guy that tried to scold me with no reason just to make himself look good, like kind of, I don't know if it's, if it's a form of virtue signaling, whatever he was doing there was the same guy that later on obviously got done for basically doing the same thing he was basically accusing me of. So there is clearly, I think, a thing that people need to keep in mind where if there's people out there that are like preaching way too loudly about being the good guy, the safe space, the this, whatever, you have to really be wary of those people, especially when they're trying too hard to basically make that a part of their personality. There's probably some fishy, very dark and dicey things going on in the background. You would want, you one would assume. But one thing I do remember Crosby did really well was the whole armband thing, um, you know, making sure everybody, because I, again, I didn't go to the parties, I remember seeing pictures and there'd always be, uh, what you what you call them like a warden or somebody kind of like a, an awareness team member always kind of floating around with their little high-vis vest on and their wristband and stuff so it was always very um, clear where you needed to go to if you needed some help and assistance and they also made it abundantly clear on the website what the rules were if you break them you're out kind of thing there was no cutting corners or anything along those kind of lines so they did a good job whilst they're around to kind of make that very clear but i guess there's probably more that could be done especially when it comes to sex positive cards there's just so much opportunities for people to take a be taken advantage of you really have to probably go out of your way to create those things and put those processes in place because if not it can get really dicey really quickly so let's end this article it says speaking to ra promoter chris symbiotic said that the educated awareness team members are present at all night uh, every symbiotic party he said he uh, said he said approachable staff and security personnel are also so present um, especially in sensitive situations he added we take all measures at our disposal to prevent the situations mentioned and if something happens to make the right decision in cooperation with the awareness team security police and paramedics but of course we can only act if we're also addressed if people talk to us because we can't put a personal bodyguard at everyone's side of the whole night this would certainly limit our fun and freedom that's pretty true because what you don't want is what we have in london right what you don't want in london and again Again, forget sex clubs regular clubs go to somewhere like a fabric you have bouncers literally you know steamrolling through the middle of the dance floor with flashlights on to make sure no one's taking bombs to just disturb the fucking flow of the night on a dance it's just horrible right so you see hordes of security you know zigzagging in between the crowd standing on the side and leering at you and shit it just is a bit of a vibe killer so especially at a sex positive club you'd imagine a security guards on the dance floor in every corner was definitely going to ruin the vibe so you have to have a middle ground but you also can't have it just to be free and just have the security outside no one kind of you know walking through and running to the situation because that's when it but people take get taken advantage of also so you have to kind of be able to have that middle ground but i guess the concerning part about it is that in this article a woman already said or somebody else said oh i've been to loads of other sex positive parties and i've never had this issue so clearly there are some parties that just know what to do. They get it right and others that don't. So that's the main problem. So it's not like an issue that permeates the entire scene. It doesn't sound like every sex positive party has this issue. It just sounds like some of them do that don't maybe take the necessary care and attention into looking after some of their patrons and shit. But again, um, I just think personally for me, if you were to ask me, I just think it's near on impossible to rid a space like that of people who are going to be creepy it's just going to always invite creepy people it's just one it's just the nature of the business you're in there's no other way to kind of get around it personally in my opinion unless you do go super heavy-handed with security but then again that ruin of the vibe and then all the people that kind of started and built your place up will probably end up kind of leaving and going elsewhere so i just think it's really hard to kind of sort that shit out but hopefully they do hopefully they figure it out because you know as much as i don't really care for Kit Kat and don't really care for sex positive parties i know that it's a you know it's a berlin institution it's a clubbing institution and it'll be sad to see it kind of you know suffer the ill effects of a couple fucking freaks or a couple psychos actually and awful people who go out of their way to disturb other people's fun and stuff but 
I'm not surprised to be honest. I have to be honest. I really am not that surprised. Um, moving on from that one, we have some news courtesy of Hypebeast we need to kind of quickly run through. The first of them to run through is this story courtesy of Hypebeast regarding Georgia Smith which I can't understand where this collaboration came from. But I have to say, it might be one of the worst things I've ever seen in my entire life. And I think Georgia Smith deserves far better than what we're seeing now on screen. So the headline says, Georgia Smith sets her musical footprint on Clark's original Desert Nomad. I don't know what that headline even fucking means. But essentially, if you're not seeing the picture, it's a picture of what you'd maybe deem to be wallabies, but they call them desert, worm, desert nomads that are backless. So they made them into a pair of mules. And then they have a tab on them that says Georgia Smith. And it's a, it's in a black colorway um, with like a, I guess like a gold foxing line along the side, along the outside of the wallaby. Um, so personally for me, I think they absolutely look trasher than trash. Like you'd never ever see me dead wearing something like these personally. And I just don't understand why this is a thing. Like surely at some point when it comes to collaborations with people who are well known, not every collab is a good idea. Some of them, but even if the money's good, it might not be a good stylistically choice for you because it just, I don't understand why these shoes even exist. Why Georgia Smith is the one promoting them. And yeah, they just look absolutely terrible. Everything about them looks absolutely horrendous. Let's read some of the blurb here. It says, renowned singer-songwriter has taken to, uh, into, of international music scene, releasing a second, oh, come on, what's all this nonsense? Um, Smith joins Clark's experiential um, original division for the first time in reinterpreting a desert nomad that returned in 2023. She removes the rear for a mule-like approach, drenching the sustainable Evo suede uppers with dark black cues tonal stitching adorns the toe box and uh per what's it got in the perimeters while speckled laces and silver hardware complete the design take a closer look at george smith and clark's collaboration which is going to be available on the 21st of october for 190 dollars fucking hell 190 for these horrendous mule wallaby desert boot type things no thank you even if maybe they came in brown like a you know like a like a birkenstock colorway maybe that might work a little bit better but i don't think so these look absolutely shocking like really 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 shocking and i'm surprised that georgia smith would agree to such a fucking collaboration they don't make any sense whatsoever i think at some point if you're a celebrity at her status you probably have to just wait for the right one to come along collab wise you should just be jumping onto the next best thing you, you see definitely wait for the right one because this doesn't feel like the right one whatsoever like even just the late the the hang tag right the swag hand tag and the laces who's going to be proudly walking down the street with a let tag that on their shoes that says georgia smith that's a little bit too much to me honest and then we see at the back of it clark's original sign the laces and stuff and then that line across the midsole okay cool it doesn't look like it's there but on the previous pictures on here it looks like it's got this like nice little silver or gold foxing strip but then on the ones that people are wearing as you see here, there is no silver foxing strip thing. So I wonder if that's just like a temporary thing that they did um, for the samples. Is it something that's going to be scrapped for the retail version? Either way, they look so shit, man. Really, really shit. I don't get it whatsoever. But hey, I guess, you know, you have to get it how you get it. August, October, sorry, 21st. If you want those, October 21st, if you want those. Another update here, courtesy of Hypebeast, regarding one of my favorite shoes ever. Um, courtesy of one of my favorite skateboarders ever, which is Jason Dill's Ada Sambas. Now they're coming in a white um, and black colorway. So you got the Samba with that translucent um, outer sole, midsole, whatever thing going on. And it's now been done in a white type colorway, which looks absolutely beautiful. And they're coke white with the black stripes and the black heel tab. These look really fucking good, man. I love these. Obviously, um, Jason Deal, you know, famous skateboarder, legendary skateboarder, Alien Workshop, fucking alumni and shit. Um, he obviously likes to wear these shoes to skate in. He, he's a he's one of those dudes that likes wearing like thin soccer type style type of shoes. So these are obviously something that he would probably wear to skate in. But for me, in terms of a good lifestyle shoe, yeah, baby, these are the ones. A pair of white jeans, some cringy white socks. I'll be outside a bar somewhere in East London pretending I smoke cigarettes, trying to roll up or whatever. You know what I mean? Living my fucking golden life. These are really nice. And to be honest, I think Samba's shape wise might be a little bit of a better option than. Oh, no, Samba's shape and comfortability wise may be a better option for me when it comes to cycling. Because I usually wear my Vans or I'll wear my. Um, 
my denim tears fucking converses because they're really thin but i would prefer maybe to wear maybe sambas or shit because they're a bit more versatile right even if i buy the black ones i can wear them with a lot of other things but the only issue is that sambas have become the gen z shoe of choice it's like the gen z air force one do you know what i mean it's like so i'm not too sure if i buy them i'd look like every other fucking you know dorky kid out here or because you know i look like so i look so old maybe people don't won't realize and they'll be like oh look there's an older guy that's just fucking wearing these shoes right people don't really care too much i'm not really sure but i like them i think they look really sick let's see what they're saying here on the blurb um expressing a mix of cloud white and core black and gold metallic the shoe features a high gloss patent leather up as marking the contrasting the price is going to be set at 120 dollars. this is a really good price bro to be honest um and they're going to be available on the 18th so have they dropped already yeah, they got a drop yesterday, so they're probably already sold out, I'd assume. Let's actually double check the site, but I'd imagine they're probably already gone in it. Let's see what we're saying here. Let's go to fucking awesome um entertainment or FA World Entertainment.com and see what um they're saying in terms of prices. Let's go to new here on their online store and see if these sambas are available. I'm assuming not. Let's see though. Let's see. I'm I'm assuming my first instinct is that like probably not. They're probably already sold out. But one twenty dollars is a really good price for these shoes. Again, it's, a, it's the it's the shoe of the moment. Everybody fucking loves Sambas, and they're obviously a limited edition colorway associated with Jason Deal, who's eternally cool. So it makes a lot of sense that people will be into them. So let's see if we have it available in my size here. Um, I'm just waiting for the screen to load up. There it goes. Let's click the drop down menu. Oh yeah, all gone, all gone. Look at that. What size are they available? Okay, they have some available. They have a size 11 point, no, nothing actually, not even my size. The only size they have available is a nine and a half, which is too small. I'm now an 11 or an 11 and a half, especially when it comes to Adidas and shit. I've got to take any chances. So they've only got 10 and a half US, 10, nine and a half and nines. And then, yeah, that's it. That's all they got available. Only a nines to 10 and a halves. Okay, fair play, but makes sense though, to be fair. Because again, really nice shoe, really well done um all white white outsole i see clear sole and most likely over time once you wear them they'll die you know they'll scuff up a little bit they'll probably get a little bit more yellow as you can see here in this picture you have this nice little yellow hint as you keep wearing them day in day out even just leaving in the box you'll get a nice little yellow hint and the contrast between the upper and the bottom will be really cool so i really like these i'm going to lie they look really really nice so big up um jason dill for putting together those great little sambas then we got this news courtesy of Hypebeast again regarding Undercover um, linking up with North Face. So I wonder if this is like no, Undercover deciding to move away from Nike because um, I forgot what the name of it was called. Is it like Gaiokosu or Gaiokosu? I have a couple of stuff from them from back in the day when I used to work at the Nike 1948 store in Shoreditch. I used to get a lot of fucking free shit from Nike and stuff. And I had a bunch of the early, early undercover um, Nike stuff, some running shoes, running gear. It was fucking great stuff. It still lasts me to this day. The quality on that stuff is super high. Um, but there hasn't been much of it lately. Maybe Drake has taken over that division. He dropped a, a collection of running inspired stuff. Um, and maybe now undercover is kind of moving on and deciding, you know what? We're going to link up with North Face. So this is called the North Face Suku. I think it's called Suku, the partnership with Undercover. And the picture here, we've got a jacket with Undercover um, branding on. We've got some gloves with Suku that says peace and love on the fingers and also a North Face logo. So let's see what this whole thing is about. It says, adding to its range of lines, John Takashi's Undercover has now come together with the North Face for a new partnership. Dubbed Suku, by the North Face um, and Undercover, the collaborative development sees the emerging and technical functioning functionality sorry, with, trust, with uh, striking styling. The teaser shared by the two labels offers a first look at the team um, while the red and black grey tonal sets. Da, 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 it's a sentence. Okay, cool. Take a close look of it. And we're going to hear about it very, very soon, I guess. We're going to hear about this stuff very, very soon. So big up undercover and north face i'm excited for it it's probably going to sell out like fucking hot cakes this is going to be resale heaven for a bunch of people when it does eventually drop resale heaven for a bunch of people when it does eventually drop moving on from this i saw these and i was thinking to myself you know what these heaven by mark jacobs and dr martin mary jane shoes they kind of remind me of the ballet flumps from Balenci from the, the ballet flats, sorry, flumps uh, from Balenciaga that I want to purchase. But it also made me think, I wonder if there's a brand out there of, of shoes who are doing like men's versions of fucking Mary Janes. 
if you don't know what Mary Jane is, Dr. Martin Shoe, please Google it if you're listening, because you're gonna be you're gonna laugh when you imagine me wearing shoes like this. But I was imagining myself dressed up um like this Aaliyah core girl. Um, in these Mark Jacob fucking uh, Mary Janes going to a rave feeling fucking really cute and shit. That could be me, you know? That could actually be me. I may be actually built the same way as her, to be fair. She might have a way flat stomach, but I'm definitely built the same way. I'm probably sure I could probably make these work. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I could probably make me so she's definitely way more better looking than me, but I'm sure I can make this definitely work. I'm sure of it. But they look really nice. Um, I'm actually loving the Heaven by Mark Jacobs collaborations with fucking Dr. Martins. I think it's definitely a collaboration made in heaven, no pun intended. Um, there's a lot of synergy between the both brands, the punk and kind of, you know, golf, underground, whatever aesthetic they're sort of going for um, is really, really cool. And they let them do some cool things with the shoes, like what you see here on the picture zoomed in. They have this really cool, um, what would you call it? I, I guess this is some sort of anklet that ties onto the back of the shoe maybe it comes with the shoe that's really cool and it spells out heaven with the screws that's really really cool idea here and you've got some also chains at the top here as well and of course you've got the little logo um teddy bear thing going on as well there so let's read the article what they're saying here it says heaven by mark jacobs is angsty sub label for boundary breaking rebels everywhere led by Brooklyn designer um ava niru heaven by oh really so he does it with a person called Ava Niru. I didn't know that, actually. I wasn't aware of this. I thought it was just Mark Jacobs doing it by himself. It does explain why it's so on point, because I was thinking, how does Mark Jacobs, as an older dude like that, be so able to, like, design for kids? Like, don't worry, he's a supreme designer, but his ability to be, like, really on point makes a lot of sense. So maybe there's this girl called Ava Niru, who I guess is part of the people that helps design Heaven by Mark Jacobs, right? Is that the person? I'm seeing them now on my profile, on my fucking Google. The, I guess your name is, how do you pronounce that? I guess it's going to be Ava Niruri, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's how you'd say it. You'd say Ava Niruri, Ava Niruri. Okay, cool. Let's look at her Instagram and see if this is the same person that I'm interested in. Let's see if there's any heaven by Mark Jacobs Association on her IG page. I'm assuming there would be. Yeah, there you go. Okay, cool. It's her. That's the Ava. Okay, cool. So Mark Jacob does it alongside this girl called Ava, who obviously helps out the design, who maybe is a little bit younger, a little bit more plugged in. Because I was always surprised at how Mark Jacobs was able to design so on point for all these kids and shit. So this makes a lot more sense. But still, sick and amazing. Love Mark Jacobs. So this makes a lot of sense. Let's continue here. It says, last summer, the duo um, decked out Dr. Martin's Mary Jane inspired model with smooth leather uppers and two headed um, teddy bear pins. Their next partnership celebrates the same model um, enlisting TikTok personality Aaliyah to take the grunge collaboration stateside. The Dr. Martin's Aiden Beck's, um, sorry, Ad Adina Beck shoe is delivered in a black with burgundy colorways crafted in 90s velvet with exposed um, bridges. I like that. I think the sole is even thicker too, if I'm not mistaken. Cause I remember when I used to work at Dr. Martin's, we had a couple of these shoes. I don't remember the sole being that thick. I think they've kind of um, bulked up the sole as well. So that's pretty good look. Uh, and then it says here, throat straps uh, boost silver hardware and feature Heaven's trademark bear decor, paying homage to tribute to the era-defining friendships. Standard Airwear pull tabs, take a closer look, and they're going to be available on the 20th. So yeah, they look great. Um, the Aaliyah girl from TikTok um, looks fantastic in them. Also, she's selling them really well in the photo shoot. So big up her. She's definitely um, been going places ever since she kind of burst out there on the scene. So good to see her absolutely smashing it. And I'm eager to see how these play out in the future with guys like myself who are going to be like, you know what? I want a pair of these Mary Janes. Give me a pair of them ASAP with a pair of Balenciaga flats and let me get right there and steal all your mums. Let me go out there and steal all your mums. <laughs> trust me. Trust me. It gets crazy out here, bro. It gets crazy. I promise you it gets flipping crazy out here. Man, them coming through and stealing people's mums and shit. You know me? So, moving on from that one, I wanted to talk slightly about this little clip that I've seen on one of my favorite YouTube podcast things that talks about techno um, called That's Techno Team. You can find it on YouTube. They've also got a pretty cool um, IG where they post loads of reels of some of the um, content they speak about. But this particular clip kind of surprised me because I guess I was unaware that people go to nightclubs and take crystal meth. I, I don't know. I, I'm aware of people take doing, you know, pills, doing ketamine, doing coke 
doing acid, doing GHB and stuff. But I never thought people would be in there doing crystal meth, to be fair. So I'm really surprised. But one of the guys on that techno team admitted to basically doing some of it back in the day and having friends that do it also. So it kind of made me think about the things that people get up to on the dance floor when they're having a good time and shit and how sometimes you can maybe trick yourself into thinking you're the you know you're the one on the dance floor that's being the liability when everyone around you is actually off their heads to be honest so let's actually play the clip and see what these guys are saying also what was particularly hard for me was also that um but 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 i think i have that in general the collapsing of people uh -huh. yeah tell me more um more. i think uh i think um uh, we all do drugs <laughs> um, I, I, I'm also very vocal that I use GHB, uh, always very vocal because I don't believe in demonizing a drug, uh, because that, 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 that would mean no GHB, but then tons of speed and ketamine mm -hmm. or mm. other drugs. I, I, yeah, I do believe that GHB and GBL in Berlin, um, are problematic mm -hmm. because they are problematic. They were also very just problematic. Just in Berlin? Just yeah, in Berlin? Why are they problematic um, in Berlin? No, it's also problematic, problematic in London. It's also very problematic. It was very problematic in Amsterdam. Mm. We see a change now in Amsterdam, though. The GHB thing is still something that kind of surprises me because, again, I, I'm so naive when it comes to sort of stuff because I guess I have such an infantile relationship with drugs and alcohol in the UK because everyone just does the same shit ad nauseum. No one really tries to explore or delve deeper. Maybe there are other parts of the nightlife scene that i've been a part of that do that but the places i've been to and i feel like i've been to a, a few different types of parties and scenes in london everyone just does the same thing rinse and repeat so when i finally did see people when i was in that burgheim toilet that one time um which is always the greatest time to go in there when you want to do some of your gear and you happen to befriend a group of people in the queue before you go in and you end up sharing a cubicle i love those occasions because those are usually a good indication of people thinking you're chill right in that short interaction in a queue or maybe sharing a couple of jokes or maybe just from your vibe and no words being spoken they're like you know what you seem cool would you want to come into our cubicle and do your stuff with us so you don't have to wait ages for people to leave and do it by yourself yeah no problem of course i will so you go in there and you just you know you get chatting and you start doing your stuff and it's fucking fun i fucking love it so one time that happened i was in a cubicle with a bunch of gay dudes who were really nice actually we had some really funny cool little conversations in there but i just, I just remember them starting to do gsb and i didn't know what it was at the time so all, all i remember them is them kind of getting a water bottle and kind of pouring a and being like literal scientists and doctors in there and making sure they pour that particular amount into that fucking lid and then it was shaking and it maybe take a bit off they were being very strict very kind of proper about it you know? and then obviously passing it around and sort of like drinking that little thing from the lid and obviously from GHB from what I've heard you have to be very disciplined in terms of the dosage you have to be disciplined when it comes to not mixing it with other drugs or alcohol and shit because it can get really dicey very quickly so it's nice that the lady on the left here on the right sorry um, I forgot what club she's a part of I remember it being featured on the Dust Techno team and we kind of gave her her, her juice and her flowers because she was really entertaining and very informative in the podcast show herself so I recommend you check it out so um let me see if i can grab the video here there this is um episode number six and it features a guest and her name is isabel ho kang um and isabel ho kang is according to the description a true og raver an active part of amsterdam's beating nightlife and a co-founder in Esther community promoter artist manager and the list goes on join our convert our trio as we have a conversation about gen z illegal raves amsterdam v berlin risky consumption of trends challenges of the scene as always feel free to join the conversation blah 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 so yeah she's she was really good so big up um isabel ho kang for opening up in this conversation but yeah i do remember that first time i saw random guys in a burkheim toilet i'm um, taking gsb and wondering what it was but again like i said i'm a big pussy i do the stuff that i do and only that and i didn't really want to take part so I just was happy to have the conversation. Um, and then later on, I found out that it became a big issue, especially during the pandemic. Um, here in London also, um, people were just trying to basically, you know, numb the pain of being inside all the time and seeing their futures and whatever else be kind of, you know, shot up in flames because of this fucking crazy virus. So they're just kind of doing drugs to sort of well away the time. And that's when people started to get a bit crazy. Addiction started to spiral and things started to get a bit risky, risque. But I also was somebody that was a little bit, oh, you know, I wouldn't say... I was a bit suspicious of the demonization of the GHB thing. 
I was like, isn't this just like every other drug that you take that if you go over the topic and kind of start controlling your life? And I'm glad that some people are coming out and saying, hey, I do it and I do it safely. But I do understand some people do go a bit crazy. But let's not demonize things because all of these things are bad. Do you know what I mean, if you actually want to live in a, um, if you actually want to have a somewhat of a healthy life, maybe cutting out all those things is probably the way to go. But because that's not likely, let's actually have an honest conversation around how to use these things safely. And obviously also say there are people out there that are doing it on a regular basis basis or maybe when they go out and have no issue whatsoever so yeah pick up her let's play the video why um, why, why is there a change how is because there a change? we try not to demonize it okay okay and talk about it mm -hmm. um, i would never advise someone mm -hmm. young to uh, to start using this drug mm -hmm. because i think it's a very dangerous uh, uh drug yeah. mm -hmm. you know in um uh, ancient times mm -hmm. no, i'm just kidding uh, they used to even use uh, crystal meth in Berka, you know, yeah. and you don't see that. No, um, I I have seen that. You have seen. It. I have seen yeah. that in my time. Yeah, I mean they they used to uh, they call it uh, Tina or whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's not a trend anymore. Right. And I'm asking myself what what happened there that made it un uninteresting anymore for many, uh, or do did the users just die? Or uh, <laughs> so, oh, I so don't think it's a very uh, it's a very sustainable drug. Okay, it's not sustainable. I, no, no, and hard so, to and, party and, and hard to party. Yeah. So if you get an addiction, you would yeah. do it uh, at home with your friends. Mm. Yes. So or many, friends, many of like heroin, friends. for example, yeah, like yeah. heroin. Yeah. Many of the people that I knew, because uh, I, I used to take it um, regularly. I would say not excessively compared to many. Uh, I never. <laughs> I love that, isn't it? All of us caners are the same, isn't it? We have a real inability to just like. Yeah, I take it. Have a good time. It's good. There's always that fucking disclaimer. I do it a lot regularly, but not a lot. It's like, come on, come on, come on. You know what I mean? Like the fact that you do it is you do it. And the fact that you do it socially when you go out and you go out often, it means it's like you do it a lot. It is what it is. But I love how we all have this kind of ability to try to trick our brain into thinking that we're not doing the thing a lot when we are doing it a lot because we enjoy it. It just is what it is. Um, I guess to the regular person who doesn't do it, it sounds absolutely crazy. But if you're amongst people who are in the same scene as you and, you know, they, they like the same thing that you like, you should be comfortable enough to say, you know what, I do it. Um, I've got it under control. No real big issue in there and just kind of keep it moving. But hey, what do I know? There you go. Uh, collapsed in public or something like this. Um, uh, but I was taking it for most parties. Um, I haven't for well this year at least. I, I don't plan to anymore, as I've realised that I, I just. Uh, <laughs> he nearly wanted to say like a long time. It was like this year at least. <laughs> Honestly, it's, it, I love how we all have the same type of like language and cadence. You know what I mean, it's like when you're <laughs> when you're when you're clean, you haven't done nothing for two weeks, and you feel like you haven't done nothing for half a year. It's like, bruh. Wind your neck in, man. It hasn't been that long. I mean, two weeks, you start fucking posting up fucking motivational quotes and pictures of yourself drinking green juice and having cold brews in the morning and going for a run. It's like, it's only been two weeks, bro. And you're only not doing it because you have no money. Not because <laughs> you have a choice <laughs> or the option to do it. It's so funny. Don't need it uh, to, to, to uh, without still being <laughs> an anecdote, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it, 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 was, it was just... I realized it was just excessive, you know, mm. gratuitous. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, many of the people who I know <clears throat> from COVID times and a, a little bit before COVID times, like say late, late 2019, um, who I knew were taking it regularly, the vast majority I'm still friends with don't touch it now yeah. at all. Yeah. Most of them are not kind of anti it. Like yeah. I don't want to be around people taking it because they understand it, but also don't feel the need for it for their experience now. And this includes DJs, party organizers, ravers. Um, there are a few that still are. Um, I, but I, I have less and less contact, kind of naturally, um, generally, with, with like people in that um, in that scene. As I have noticed, there is kind of we rarely see anyone who's, let's say, obviously, <clears throat> obviously, subjectively, you know, because yes. I know I know what it looks like if someone is is taking a lot of this drug. Um, but there's. Very few people at, for example, Drift or these smaller parties where um, it's like, yeah, so what you described yeah. is a, like, if I see someone collapsing, I, that ruins my mood yeah. for the rest of the party. It, like, not just from a point of I'm worried about this person's health, but also the point of like, this is making me hyper aware that because this person's done that and actually that person is clearly taking G, that person, that person, that person. Is this going to happen again? You know what's really funny though? 
in Berlin, they have such a no tolerance vibe around people that collapse. You go to many clubs, many a club, some of the most popular ones out there, the Bergkinds, the this, the that, and they will legitimately chuck these motherfuckers out. I think Bergkind have this um, process where they have like an ambulance or something around the corner, around the back. So as you're queuing up in front of the door, on your left hand side, there's like a on the left and then you turn a right, there's allegedly some sort of ambulance there or something, right? I've never gone around that cycle. I always go the other way to go home and shit or to go back to my um, Airbnb or hotels are usually in the other direction. But there's usually some sort of like awareness team, van, ambulance. There's something there. They always point people to go over there. I've seen people walk all the time get chucked out and they point them over there. They have no tolerance for like trying to make sure the person's better or anything. They don't want any of that shit. If anything, it's like... um. I wonder if it's a plausible deniability. It's just they don't want somebody to die on their premises because they took too many drugs. So they'd just rather you go outside and sort it out on your own. <laughs> I remember one time specifically, there was this girl that was super fucked that was talking to me while I was sitting down somewhere. And I guess I wasn't really noticing because I wasn't really paying attention to what she was saying. I was on my phone. And then I guess someone must have noticed her being too crazy and acting too drunk. So they told the bouncer. But then she was sitting next to me and, she, and I guess she was moving around a lot. So I took her bag and she was falling on the floor and I put her bag next to me. Like she was like moving. I was just like, okay, cool. I was putting on my phone, whatever. Like let her do what she wants. And then when she's ready, she can take her bag. But I guess in the confusion of what was going on, a security guard came, took her straight away. By the time I realized she was getting took and I remembered, oh shit, the bag's on the floor. So I went to go and follow them to go give her a bag before she got chucked out. And then that's when I saw the whole like, oh yeah, go around the corner thing. And they had no regard. And then when I even, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure when I gave the guy the bag to give to the girl, he literally like, you know, like he did like a frisbee throw it to her down the road. It was like, look, get the fuck out of here. So maybe the attitude around them is like, hey, um, don't bring your problems here. Like, don't like bring all your fucking struggles and pains here and then try and drown them out here and then have us be responsible for you that's unfair so like kind of a sort of like hey do your drugs responsibly be a grown-up don't get too fucked up to a point where you can't handle yourself but if you do we're not going to look after you we're not going to baby you. we're going to leave you out there on the street so you can fend for yourself because you put yourself in this position or it's just a like hey we don't want to get shut down and the last thing that we want on our conscience or on our record is that somebody passed away here or whatever it may be and it's going to make us look bad so we'd rather you kind of pass away on the streets type of thing it's kind of wild but i've seen it happen often um the custom of people inside the clubs makes you spoil the night not really to be fair it doesn't ruin my night um i completely understand why it's happening people just doing too much unfortunately because I guess I live in a country where people do it too much anyway. We are the land of too much. That's why we always have the government have to step in and, you know, enact laws to ban things because we can never enjoy things in moderation. A good example is the balloons. Maybe the balloons thing is like a weird psyop. It's like a weird sort of like covert operation by the government to essentially extinguish any sort of fun that people from the working class have or whatever because balloons were a really cheap way for people who don't have much money to get high without being too damaging to themselves or was a way people that don't have much money don't want, don't want to get involved in heavy drug selling could maybe make some money by selling balloons and canisters and shit so maybe it was a government's approach to ban that whole thing to sort of like diminish that aspect of things who knows but we can't deny that people went OD when they went to balloons in, in the UK. We went too hard to the point where kids are in hospital with like internal organ failure. Some I saw a story of somebody that essentially became paraplegic because they took too many fucking balloons. So we do stuff to, to an excess and to a point where we give the government no other choice but to step in and sort of like baby us and give us rules and shit and regulation about what you can and can't do anymore. So maybe because of that, um, and me seeing a lot of people on dance floors collapsing and fainting, um, you know, fabric alone, I've probably seen like 10 people collapse on that dance floor. And it's usually because they've just done too much. And um, so I'm not really, you know, it doesn't really phase me. And I know, again, like I said, I know it's most likely their fault for just not being a little bit more aware of their body, understanding how much they can take and how much they can't take. And I don't want to let that ruin my night because, again, it's London. I've only got four hours to rave anyway. I can't be <laughs> sitting here, standing here, sorry, worried about the next man when I've, I've paid £35 to get in and I've got four hours to get loose and dirty before they chuck me out right on the dot. So that maybe plays into all of it. But I was just more surprised that crystal meth has become a drug of choice in the scene. 
it kind of alleviates a lot of the concerns and fears that I have when I go out and I sometimes have this you know dread if dread dreadful feeling that I'm being a liability that I'm doing too much that I'm too fucked up it's like bro I'm not even doing that much crazy stuff really when I'm on the dance floor so if anything you should make you feel somewhat comforted that even at your worst right you're not there on the dance floor like a zombie like other people are when they're doing other things um and then maybe just to kind of keep it in mind to just do your drugs well which is a really hard thing to do to be that mature to be able to kind of um you know drink responsibly and do drugs responsibly people just don't do it like that it's like even with cigarettes and shit people always take shit to an excess so i don't know what i don't know how that comes about if that's a maturity thing if that's a how most humans learn where you have to get legitimately burnt and then you realize oh shit i'm doing too much or if it's something that you can actually learn along your kind of like journey of discovering new parts of the scene and evolving and maturing and bloody blah, blah 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 i don't really know but i was kind of shocked to see that there are people on the dance floor taking crystal meth but it does explain quite a bit about berlin and that scene overall because if anything they are probably got the opposite problem that we have we probably do the thing where we do the same drugs all the time you know ad nauseum because we only have a limited hours of going out and we don't have the time to experiment whereas they have clubs are open 17 plus hours so you have every time all the time in the world sorry to do what you want to kind of get a bit crazy get a bit loose and it kind of would be a waste of an opportunity not to get crazy right not to try a micro dose not to try other types of drugs not to try maybe you know research chemicals whatever you want to try you're probably within your you're probably it's if there's any perfect time to do it it'll probably be if you live over there so I completely understand why they go that far and why they try other things and dibble dabble. But I just don't think it would work here, unfortunately. Put, unfortunately. Like, imagine trying to take an LSD or an acid trip in a regular club in London. Like, it's a waste of time, right? I mean, by the time that kicks in, you're already chucked out. <laughs> now you have to fend for yourself on a Jubilee line. Good luck. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not going to work, but yeah. Um, big up that, that's, that's Techno Team. One of my more favorite um, pods to listen to. I know some people don't like it because they say like, you know, it's just these guys kind of bloviating about the scene and shit, but I'm sorry. I love to bloviate myself. I love to ramble myself. I love to take... Um, things like nightlife and clubbing way more seriously than what they actually are and these guys are the personification of it because they live in one of the most you know professional clubbing environments in the world in berlin and even the conversation they had around like amsterdam and berlin competition in terms of what's better place in nightlife because i've heard a lot of people i've seen a lot of my friends who are associated with nightlife moving out to amsterdam and shit and they've been enjoying themselves over there and one particular um, person i know online basically said at the time they went to the school that it was actually a better vibe than they went to berkheim it's actually a better party so clearly there's a good atmosphere and a scene over there bubbling so for me um i like listening to these sort of things and hearing it so if you like that sort of stuff also i recommend you check out their youtube channel it's das which is d-a-s techno team on youtube um they've got loads of cool little videos out there and of course they've got a good little social media presence they probably do the thing that i should do when it comes to social media online and clipping myself and putting it online but i don't usually do it but hey what can you do um big up that techno team big up that little discussion check it out if you haven't got that time check it out if you like that sort of stuff and you got that time anyways that has been the excellent Show episode number what 717 i think right thank you for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual if you've enjoyed this show and you've liked what you've heard please make sure you like underneath you subscribe and all that good stuff that'd be greatly appreciated if you listen via the audio side of the podcast please leave me a five-star review and if you're listening to the audio side of the podcast you should be hearing my tune today playing underneath my sultry tunes or my fault my sultry 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 tones whatever that term is let me know i ain't drink more water um i need my voice right now but thank you for joining me it's been a pleasure to have your company and i'll see all you guys again very very soon take care everybody peace out